Hi, welcome to Player Base. I'm GR, and this schmutz on my shirt is the pollen from these lilies. Smells like Easter. So today, we are going to put up the first part of a multi-part series, which is a deep dive on the feedback from the playtest of the one D&D material that they have out so far that was due this weekend. The first segment is going to be about their wrestling with the human race. And this is very important because the problem that WotC and previously TSR had with making the human race as a racial option desirable for people isn't that it's underpowered or that optimized builds for magic users or certain types of rangers or fighters or what have you are better suited towards other racial class combinations. The problem is that being a human in D&D is uh, plain and boring and useless. And that is true all the way down the line to the beginning, back when race and class was the same thing. So a uh, little fun fact, uh, Gygax, of the four of them, it was Gygax, Arneson, Perrin, and I just forget the third guy's name, sorry. Um, Gygax was not a big Tolkien fan. In fact, he really wanted to focus on human characters in his games for a variety of reasons, but the way that he did that, the way that he incentivized people to play humans in Dungeons and Dragons in the first edition and in you know, the white and red box chainmail, is that there was a level cap for elves and dwarves. So dwarves could be like a level eight fighter, I think, and then elves could be like a level seven fighter and a level five magic user, but humans could go all the way. So from the very start, the way that they incentivized people to play as humans was to disincentivize them playing as elves and dwarves, which is the game mechanic equivalent of eat your vegetables. Not exactly the most enticing or enthralling mechanic when trying to engage in uh, the persona amplification of a uh, mythological narrative, which is really what people want to do when they're playing a game like this. And, you know, the problem for WotC now, which was the problem that TSR had, but WotC is better suited to dealing with it, is that they think of the game and they ask people about the game within the context of the syntax of its legacy, which is to say a wargaming rule set. Chainmail came out of um, the late Geneva you know, gaming group that Gygax and Perrin and Arneson were in, or maybe it was just Gygax and Arneson, I forget the details on that. But it was a way to basically play the general character as its own individual character in the armies that you would have for like a Napoleonic War or for a medieval battle. So, you know, games like Dota were the very origin, basically, of D&D. And for those of you who are not familiar, uh, you know, those types of games like Dota and, and League of Legends uh, came out of... Uh, a mod for Warcraft 3, which is a real-time strategy game where you have armies. And Warcraft is itself just like a chibi version of Warhammer, which is itself just a Tolkien version of Napoleonic war games. And all of that legacy of wargaming is in the rule set and in the structure. And they think of it that way, and they ask people questions that way, which is why there's all this stuff about the feats and the human variant and you know, how can you make people want to have like a powerful human? But, you know, the problem with that thinking is this is not a competitive game. In Dota, in League of Legends, in, uh, you know, Line Square and Shot, or whatever it's called, you know, in, in traditional wargaming, the complexity of the rules and the specificity of the rules is such that you have a sense that even with an asymmetrical build of an army, you have a relatively fair fight against an opposing army in a competition to win and avoid losing. There's a win state and a loss state for the players involved. 
and the adjudicator is the two people playing. And that's not true in D&D. &D. And, and their lack of conceptualizing this, although I'm sure they know it, is one of the reasons that the really selling the whole concept of being a dungeon master to people or providing the infrastructure socially and mechanically in the rule sets and in the way that they message to make it more appealing and approachable for people is one of the fallouts of this because it's not the players against the dungeon master. The dungeon master or the game master, if you're playing a different type of role-playing game or you prefer that terminology, is playing a whole different game than the people who are playing as the player characters. It, they're not the same game. They're almost completely independent of one another. And the fact that they use the same mechanical rule set is not because they're diametrically opposed, but because the set of rules in Dungeons and Dragons is there not to create a fair fight, but to give you a sense of easily understandable, understandable and mutually agreed upon uh, abstraction of phenomenology so that when you're playing, you get the kind of haptic feedback that you would from the real world. That's why you don't have to roll a dexterity check to open a door, but you do to pick a lock because you don't really know if you're picking a lock, if you can do it or if you can do it in time or if while you're doing it, you're going to get caught. And if you've picked a lot of locks, you're more likely to do it, which is why you get a bonus. That's what that's about. It's meant to give you a sense of what the world that you're in is like and to give you sort of the cause and effect feedback of a whole universe. And the Dungeon Master's game is to create that universe in a way that is plausibly, palpably believable for the players. That's the job. And it's fun, it's a lot of work, but it's fun, but it's a completely different game than being a player character. There's a lot of crossover, but it's not the same. And, you know, that's one of the principal issues. It's the issue of paradigm with how they're approaching these changes, and that's always been the issue. Um, but we're at a particular moment in the history of role-playing games, and particularly in the history of Dungeons and Dragons, because not only is it more popular than ever, but the vast majority of people who are playing Dungeons and Dragons are millennials and Zoomers. 75% of the people who play D&D &D are 35 or under. So all of this, you know, vestigial legacy stuff that they put in 5th edition to, well, look, I guess to accommodate people like me, um, at, if only to reassure us that they weren't going to do 4th edition again, like, it isn't necessary to hold on to that stuff quite in the same way that I'm holding on to this cup and microphone. Ah, delicious coffee. However, that's not to say to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'm, I'm just approaching this with you really quickly. The problem with humans is that they have no clear idea on why anyone would want to be a human in a fantasy game. It's not the same thing as there being no reason or no idea, but they don't have it. And my guess is maybe you don't either. I'll give you an example. If you want to play smart elf with sword, what race are you, what sub race are you going to play? What character classes might you look to choose from to see which one best suits your play style and the type of narrative focus that you want to do, right? Because you could do an eldritch uh, blade master, or you could do uh, a battle master, or you could do a ranger. Or you could do a monk, a Kensei monk. You know, you have at least six different uh, character, class, subtype focuses to connect to the racial subclass to make Smart Elf with Sword functional. And what I mean by functional is that the options they give you and the rules that they give you allows for you to work through that narrative, which is what you are looking to do if you're playing D&D. &D. Like, I mentioned it somewhere else in the, in, the, in the bit here, but like, you know, if I want to obsess over the minutiae of rules to the point where I need a CRISPR machine to 
splice genomes together on the molecular level, I'll just fire up Steam and play Warhammer with my brother until the thing crashes. Um, <laughs> R.I.P. Warhammer um, until they fix that patch. But uh, that's besides the point. The issue is the game set that we have for Dungeons and Dragons is it's not a war game with story elements. And it's also not a story game with uh, war gaming elements. It's a set of tools that allow you to do both of those things and a whole bunch of other things as well. It's a toolbox. And the reason that no one is using this wrench is because they have all these other wrenches that serve particular purposes and they haven't gotten clear on messaging to you what this wrench is for or why you would want to use it. So let's say you don't want to do smart elf with sword. Let's say you want to do uh, quick elf with bow. Now, loads of people have just thought of doing uh, a wood elf ranger or, you know, a, uh, a bow-focused fighter of some kind. And then loads of other people uh, were thinking, no, no, I'll be a high elf or I'll be a drow, but I'll do it like this. And that's my point. You already have like an idea in your head of where you're going to go with that. And if there's a reason that you wanted to be like a dark elf or a high elf with a bow and how you would work that out mechanically, you have the tools within the rule set to work out that narrative. And you don't have that for humans. Like if you want to be bearded, beard dwarf with craft, right? Or um, like monstrous, so strong, homunculoid, monstrously big, right? I mean, there's a whole bunch of like sub races throughout every edition of D&D that let you be some big hulking mass, right? Goliath, Half-Orc, Centaur, you know, I could go on, but I won't because the video is long enough. But what is the adjective human noun? Like what's the blank human with blank? To the cliche fantasy human, right? Where would you go for that? How would you even think about that? Do you have an idea? Because they clearly don't. That's why they're finicking about these rule sets. And like, let's say, for instance, that they got the human variant rule right or whatever, and so that it was really powerful mechanically to use a human, then everyone would feel compelled to play a human because they would feel like they were missing out. And, you know, even if someone makes your favorite meal and they put it, say, like, 30 centimeters or like a foot away from you and then they put like the cheap not good chocolate chip cookies but a whole plate of them 10 centimeters or like three or four inches in front of you you might struggle to reach for the plate of the real meal because the, the shitty cookies are right in front of you I'm not talking about the good chocolate chip cookies I'm talking about the bad ones you know the ones that were like it's like you could tell that like they didn't yeah and that's that's kind of what they're finicking about here the answer to this problem isn't to make humans more powerful. The answer is to give people a clear message on why they would want to play humans. And this ties into some other stuff um, in the next video that I'll talk about with the other options. But basically, I mean, one of the things that you could do is you could, because an issue, and this is a pervasive issue, which they haven't figured out because of this paradigm, is making people who are not feel more welcome in the game, right? And I've onboarded a lot of people. I've been onboarded a lot of people uh, who are not like, you know, relatively butch uh, Caucasian dudes. And I can tell you, I learned some things from that. Uh, one of the things that you could do, uh, which I would recommend somewhere else, I'll do a whole other set of videos on, is because, you know, there was a video of like some Asian woman who's working on the Watsi team saying she didn't see herself in the game yeah, you know, like, you need to be putting out more material where there's, like, Asians and Africans and South Asians and, um, and Near Eastern and Mesoamerican people, like, central to the material you're putting out, right? Schult is not going to do it. Like, that's fine, but, like, I don't want to sweat my balls off, like, riding a dinosaur. Like, that's cool, but that's not, you know, there's no campaign material about, say, like, an East Asian uh, high elven empire. I have one, or a rough analog equivalent of Middle Earth, but in like, you know, Central and West Africa. I have one of those two. Stuff like that, that would, pay, that would make people feel more welcome. 
working out like what their narratives are, that would make them feel more welcome. I mean, you know, because the game was built from the ground up by people more or less from my class and uh, not exactly ethnic background, but like they're European, so they're white enough. Um, or I'm white enough, I should say. He's an Irish and Italian. Not exactly white, but white enough. And, you know, they, they work within the narratives that I already understand that are speaking to me and are about me. You know, I can play Smart Elf with Sword in any edition of the game and feel relatively satisfied within the limits of the rules that I'm being provided for. I mean, because, you know, the whole structure of elves as we understand them comes from, you know, Tolkien's uh, distilling the intermixing of Anglo-Saxon and to a lesser degree Norse, um, as well as uh, Britonic and Celtic mythology into uh, uh, an extraction that, you know, speaks to some of the Jungian archetypes that I work with. So I can be like an overeducated, slightly aloof, uh, elven guy with a, with a long sword and feel like I'm doing that more or less. And even the rough, the rough equivalent for say like, you know, uh, someone who's like Han Chinese, right? We don't have that. Or someone who's West African. We don't have that. We could, right? You know, um, I mean, I've done it. Like it's not that hard to even just to, to just graph that on. And that's a whole other, but that's a whole other issue. It's a whole other set of videos. Uh, getting back to just this, because it goes even before that, like they don't have an idea of like what a human would be like desirably in a narrative in this type of like character arc that they're presenting to you. Because that's, I mean, that's really the draw. You get to be freed from the prison of your own ego by putting on another persona, even if it's relatively close to yours, for a brief period of time. That's where the real elation of playing a role-playing game come from. You no longer have to be yourself for a while. So why would you want to be a human? Like, have they looked at Numenorians or Targaryens? You know, have... That would be the first place I would look because, you know, cunning, capricious, ambitious, creative, uh, malleable destiny, mercurial. There's all kinds of things in those stories that are really attractive to people. Like, it, you know, by contrast, in most like Tolkien-centered games, like you know, video games, and in you know, especially social games or uh, role-playing games that are relatively large, the attraction of being a Gondorian, it like the like Gondor, like the population of players, much higher than like all of the Elven factions put together. So it's not that they're giving the Tolkien bit more juice. It's that they don't have a clear idea on why anyone would want to be a human, and making them more powerful is not the answer. Another good place to look would be Warhammer, like 40k, because like they do humans right. You know, if you look at the output of, you know, White Dwarf 40k, just Space Marine chapters, not even other human factions, but just Space Marine chapters, the ratio of the number of them to everything else they put out, like humans and aliens together, is like two to one. And, you know, that place is like a Mexican restaurant. Like, there's lots of stuff on the menu, but it's all basically the same burrito. People don't respond to the different Space Marine chapters or just the concept of Space Marines in general because they're necessarily more powerful than the other Space Marine chapters or the aliens. They do so because they respond to the mostly nonverbal, but the, the implied and explicit narrative, the thesis of archetypes that it resonates within them. And they don't have anything like that. And that's why this has been a problem literally since day one. And thinking about it in terms of like what the power options are is a mistake. You know, this is a common issue in marketing and, 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 and advertising and market research. Uh, there's the, the example of they were trying to find out what type of coffee to sell to people. And so they asked 100 people, what type of coffee do you prefer? And like 80% of them said, I like it black and strong. 
when in actual fact, when they gave them taste tests, the vast majority of people, and almost, pretty much almost everyone who said that they like it black and strong, preferred it with lots of sugar and lots of cream. Uh, side note, I do actually drink it black because as you can see, I have a tendency to spill things on myself. When you don't have sugar in it, it doesn't get quite so sticky. And when you have milk in it, it doesn't get quite so nasty. But that's not the point. The point is, if you give them with the, this kind of questionnaire and the multiple choice is within the, the framework of, is this powerful enough? Well, they're of course gonna say no because they're unsatisfied because you're not even asking the right question because you, you don't have the framework for it. The problem is the framework, not the options. And that's enough about humans for today. But uh, before we go, if you like this, uh, leave a comment and let us know. And if you didn't like this, Oh man, uh, you've already left the comment, and so thanks for letting us know. Subscribe, uh, press the little like button, or the dislike button, but I prefer if you press the like button. Press the little bell icon if you can. Uh, share it with your friends, share it with your enemies, and come back uh, tomorrow or later in the week for more of this stuff so that you can either like really feel you're getting something of value or you can like hate watch. Either way, uh, I'm GR, this is Playerbase, and uh, thanks so much for your time.